Check, check, check. Sound good? My name is Rick Newell, and if you haven't noticed yet, I am white. I'm about as white as you can be, uh, but for the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about African Americans, which means I'm probably going to unintentionally offend somebody, right? Uh, in fact, I may have already done it, and all I've done is introduce myself, right? Uh, <laughs> In practicing for this, uh, my white friends told me to include things that my black friends have said, don't say that. And uh, my black friends have told me to include things that my white friends have said, don't say that. <laughs> so I've already offended all of my friends um, because this is hard, right? It's, I just want to acknowledge that talking about race is hard. Uh, this has been a part of my story from the beginning. My parents named me after my dad's best friend in college who was black, Claiborne Richard Jones. He was third in the nation in scoring in Division I basketball, and he was also in my parents' wedding, which doesn't mean much nowadays, but back in the 60s, having a black guy on your wedding was kind of a big deal. Uh, so knowing I've been named after him is one of the reasons we started this organization called MUST. Can I tell you some scenes that for the last 11 years have happened almost every day in my neighborhood of the Rainier Valley? Act one we'll call childhood. A healthy African-American baby with all the promise and potential a newborn brings is born into poverty with only one parent. Most African-Americans don't grow up in poverty, but far too many do. And the parent of this one is going to have to work at least one low-paying job and or be on uh, assistance. So the environment he's going to grow up in is often really hard. Act 2, high school or the last stop. Rarely is anyone going to get him up in the morning for school or ask him about his grades, and even though he has as much potential as you or I, he's going to become lost in the system and drop out of high school. Act three, after high school, without a diploma or guidance, he has very little way of knowing what it takes to earn an honest living or raise a family, and so that lonely, discarded, angry kid has a 69% chance of going to prison. And then his kids grow up without a dad. 760 African Americans dropped out of high school in the last class in the Seattle Public School District because the system in America has failed. 760. That's as if two whole high schools didn't graduate their senior classes. 69% of the males will go to prison. We all know those that have been shot and killed. Or they often continue in this cycle of poverty they've been living in. 760. It feels hopeless, doesn't it? But it's not. I wanted to share with you some stories how some very unique individuals are helping these guys rewrite Acts 2 and 3 of their lives into some really cool stories. I want to introduce you to Shaheem. We call him Shy, but he is anything but shy. Uh, he's extremely affable, bright, a good athlete, and as he's quick to point out, very handsome. Uh, his Act 1 occurred right here in Seattle. His dad was never really in the picture. His mom died of a drug overdose. Um, so imagine your childhood with neither your mother nor your father. His act two, his grades were low. He ended up stealing a car. Uh, the promise and potential he was born with was beginning to erode away. Uh, and not to sound sensational, but prison or early death right around the corner. His best childhood friend was shot and killed just two years ago. And think about life from many of these kids' perspectives. Would you have honestly finished high school if no one got you up in the morning for school or asked you about your grades? Um, or what if the only square meals you got were the ones you got at school? Or you didn't have enough clothes? One kid I know well has been to four different high schools in a little over a year, and not because he's a bad kid. And those are just a few of the issues that many kids face. Shy didn't face all of those issues. He was raised by his great aunt, who is a great lady, and he still struggled. But if you face some of those issues, you might also find yourself making shockingly bad decisions. So it begs the question, what could alter his life from what feels like his destiny? Prison, early death, to a totally different life, rich with possibility. Before we look at a solution, we're hearing many great ideas today, just a solution. Uh, I would like to look at the problem a little deeper. In my opinion, the greatest need in the urban core by quite a bit, I think second place is way behind, is positive male role models. When you fix this, you fix a lot. 
The tragic fact is more than half of African American kids will grow up without the influence of their father, per a 2012 Census Bureau report. But here's the deal. If you get anything, two things out of this talk, this is one of them. Because so many African American males are separated from the kids, the temptation might be to think that when they're with their kids, they're bad fathers. But that's just not the case. A study comparing fathers of different races with kids ages one through four, African Americans took three out of the top four spots. They ate with their kids more, they bathed and dressed their kids more, they read to their kids more, and they almost played with their kids more than any other dad. With kids ages five to 18, they again took three out of the top four spots. My many years of experience can attest to this. African Americans are simply naturally amazing dads. So why are so many absent? That's the question, isn't it? And it's also a whole nother TED Talk. It really is. Uh, but really quickly, I want to point to two. The first one, as you can probably guess, dates back to the earliest days of our country. Isabel Wilkinson's amazing Pulitzer Prize winning book spells it out really well. Uh, there's an old saying that children inherit their parents' pain. Well, we as Americans allow African American kids to inherit the many, many, many generations of pain and injustice that African Americans have faced. And that affects African American fathers today. The second reason that African American males are separated from their kids is that they are jailed at a much higher rate than any other segment of our population. We jail more African American males, just the males, than the whole prison population, all race, all genders, the whole prison population of India, and Argentina, and Canada, and Lebanon and Japan, and Germany, and Finland, and Israel, and England combined. You take all the prisoners from all nine of those countries and put them together in one spot, and you still do not have as many African American males as we have locked up in our country. India alone is more than three times as large a country as we are. African Americans make up just 13% of the U.S. population, but 38% of the prison population and they serve nearly 20% longer prison sentences than a white male convicted of the exact same crime. A famous rapper named Tupac, who was later shot and killed, wrote when he was young, those that knew me would easily co-sign that no one has had a life as hard as mine. No father, no money, no chance, and no guide. I only follow the voice inside. In so many ways, these kids are set up to fail. African-American males have been systematically removed from society, and children have been robbed of their fathers. We hand them that pain the day they were born. Society also tells these kids they are at-risk youth. Imagine how you would feel if your whole childhood you were told you were at risk instead of uh, full of potential. You live in fear, right? A study by Columbia University labeled, instead of calling them at risk, they call them opportunity youth. And the study revealed that between the ages of 16 and 24, there are 6 million opportunity youth and each one costs society on average six to $700,000 over the course of their lifetime. Uh, they pass, they uh, are more prone to hit the criminal justice system, welfare, public health care, and they pass the same patterns on to their kids. Shy, the handsome fellow I mentioned before, was paired with a positive male role model when he was just 15. When he graduated, he wrote his mentor and said, I don't know where I would be without you. So how did he get here? Uh, let me tell you real quick. Uh, about 12 years ago, I went from a great career in technology, working at companies like Microsoft, so Microsystems Singular, to teaching high tech at a very small community center in the urban core. It was one of the best decisions of my life, and it uh, really changed me in some wonderful ways. I, I worked there for seven years, and I took mental notes on what I felt were the main issues. Uh, and there was one issue that stood out far above all the others, one issue that hurt the most kids, the most families, the most number of times. And that was lack of positive male role models. Single mothers can only do so much, right? Single mothers are superheroes. They are the anything and everything for their kids. Uh, but they are often stretched beyond their limit because they have to be for their kids. And they often have problems of their own, anxiety, employment problems, domestic issues. Um, I saw kids with all the potential in the world erode over time without the support of a strong male figure. Um, and it made me mad, not just as a... Uh, parent, but as a problem solver, to think, to see the same issue happening over and over and over again. The other thing I noticed when I was there is that almost every year I worked there, a great guy in his early to mid 20s would come and work there for about a year. Great guys. You would trust them with kids, responsible. Uh, they had made it through high school, but they didn't go to college. 
I went to college based because I didn't have a choice. It was a, you know, a paved road, and I could see the next stop, graduation. But these guys couldn't even see the road, much less the next stop, and so their struggle continued. However, while I was working there, I became aware of an organization called Friends of the Children. And they take kindergartners who are in the most danger, um, parents are incarcerated on drugs, what have you, and they give them a paid professional mentor all the way through high school. $10,000 a year for 12 and a half years, $130,000 for one kid. Amazing. Friends has helped thousands of kids from Harlem, New York to Cornwall, England, and has been doing paid professional mentorship for more than 20 years. They have the outcomes to prove that it works and a Harvard study to show that it's more than worth the financial investment. This little idea began to grow in my mind. Why not take the friends of the children model, a proven model that works, and apply it to the two big issues I saw every day. Kids desperately needed positive male role models, and positive male role models desperately needed help getting to and through college. Now, what better way for a kid to imagine himself in college than seeing somebody a lot like himself in college? He comes from the same place I do. If he can do it, so can I. And suddenly the road appears. The next stop appears for them. And an organization my wife and I have devoted our lives to was born. I mentioned an organization is called MUST. It stands for Mentoring Urban Students and Teens. Mentoring is a must. <laughs> uh, MUST is a four-year mentoring program. We find and hire positive African-American male role models who want to pursue their higher education. And we pay them well to mentor African-American males who are genuinely in danger of dropping out of high school. Uh, the model can work with young women, Latinos, foster care. This is just who we are spending time with. Uh, and what makes the model unique is that our mentors are so highly relatable, and we're helping both the youth and the mentor break the cycles in which they've been living. And here's what it looks like. During the year, we talk to guys like Mr. Marcus, Coach Dom, the community, and find positive male role models. Uh, I'm a parent. I have four boys. I understand the risks involved. Uh, I look at it as if these guys will be mentoring my own kids. Um, and in many wonderful ways, they do end up mentoring my own kids. Uh, we do background checks, drug tests, interview people all around them, getting a sense of who they really are. Um, and we hire a spectrum of mentors, guys who are going to go to the university and get good grades, and guys who are kind of scared they're not going to make it through community college. Um, but all of our mentors get the support they need, and they have um, the support they need to get all the way through college. Um, we ask our mentors to try and commit to four years to the youth that they will be mentoring. Um, they have PhDs in experience, and we pay them well for that experience. They start at about $20 an hour for 16 hours a month for each youth that they are mentoring. There are not enough programs that serve the 18 to 25-year-old age range of our mentors. They are among the most valuable resources in the urban core, and we should treat them like gold. Seriously, like gold wrapped in platinum with a diamond on it. <laughs> they have the power to rewrite Acts 2 and 3 for every kid they touch, to literally take them in an entirely new direction in life. Plus, society saves $700,000 per kid because that kid will grow up to be a regular guy like you and me. Not in prison, not shot and killed. In the spring, we work with middle school counselors to find youth who are genuinely in danger of dropping out of high school. Uh, we have nine criteria. Nine, nine criteria that are strong indicators of youth dropping out. Uh, low grades, more than 20 absences from school, parents are incarcerated. Uh, and then in between the youth, eighth grade year and freshman year of high school, they're paired with a mentor that looks like them and talks like them, and the four-year relationship begins. This is the last stop for many of them. If you do not reach them now, they could be gone forever. Youth meet with their mentors for breakfast once a week during the school year. They talk about everyday things like boys talk about with their fathers, um, relationships, sports. Uh, but remember, the hole we're trying to fill is positive male role models. So we also talk about something we call eight things that make a man. Uh, and each year, both mentor and youth are asked to work on just two of the eight. Uh, the first one is a man does the dishes. No, that's not the first one. <laughs> man does do the dishes. My dad taught me that. Thanks, Dad. Um, no, the first one is a man is reliable. He do what you say. Uh, the second one is a man owns his mistakes. Just getting those two down gives any guy a jump start on life. Every other weekend we go and do fun and new experiences as a group. Movies, go-karts, tour the university, life skill classes. Uh, the activities keep them off the street and connected to the program, but often provide experiences they would not have otherwise. Uh, one youth who's been with the program while said the other day that the best memories of my life are with you guys. 
And plus, they're building relationships with other guys headed in the same direction. We say, show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. Our mentors don't go it alone. They're assigned volunteer coaches who are older, successful men in the community who've agreed to meet weekly with the mentor to help them uh, navigate college and to be a great mentor and better man. Only 11% of first-generation students will finish college, so the relationship with the coaches, another positive male role model, are really vital to what we do. I'm sure you know this, but mentoring works. A study funded by the Gates Foundation reported that quality short-term mentoring, a nine-month average, reduces depression, increases grades, increases social acceptance. But you need long-term outcome-based mentoring like ours with highly relatable mentors to really help with deviant behavior, sexual activity, substance abuse. This is Shy Today, Tackling College. It's not easy, but it is opportunity happening right now. We are seeing guys who would have dropped out of high school, go to college, and probably become mentors for us. If that does not get you excited, you got to check your pulse right now. Um, I want to tell you a story that will happen in my neighborhood in the Rainier Valley of Seattle, Washington. Act 1, uh, we'll call childhood a healthy African-American baby with all the promise and potential a newborn brings is born into a great family with a great dad. He will eat with them, play with them, read to him. Act two, high school or the next stop. He's going to do really well in high school because his parents are on him about his grades. And because his dad had a positive male role model when he was in high school, who checked his grades every week and taught him what it means to be a man. Act three, after high school, the world is a limit for this guy, right? Rocket scientist, world famous scholar or just a regular guy like you and I who has compassion for others and sees ourselves as worthy of spectacularly awesome regular lives. My personal mission, my hope, is to preserve the potential every child is born with, to give them the potential to shine, to rise to be whoever they can be, and not what their early life circumstances condemn them to be. Thank you very much.